Although it's not visible to the eye, there's an omnipotent force that has a powerful effect on this nation of ours. Amplified by newspaper editors and talkback hosts, it's something that we find irresistible, even as it eats away at our very core. It has many names, but it's most commonly known as fear. The frightened man first stands like a statue, motionless and breathless. The heart beats quickly and violently. New Zealanders have been living in a state of almost constant fear since the day that Coupe first struck bad weather. But he could never have imagined that one day increased maritime safety would almost be his people's undoing. The artificial beacon which shines atop this lighthouse is a monument to fear. For the local settlers afraid of shipwreck, it was a friend. But for local Maori, it was most certainly foe. The construction of the lighthouse at Taranaki was delayed by local Maori from nearby Parihaka, who staged a peaceful protest just a few months before the infamous invasion and eviction of their nearby settlement. Little wonder then that a hundred years later, many believed that the white man was finally going to get what was coming to him as fear of an armed Maori uprising spread through the country. Our story really begins at Red Beach, a little north of Auckland, on a Sunday in mid-1987. We are closer to a bloody revolution in this country than anyone ever thought could ever happen in New Zealand. The visiting speaker at the local Methodist church is Mrs Sharon Fawcett, a fiery preacher and the subject of her sermon, Armed Māori Radicals. They're all trained to kill man, woman and child. First came the anonymous informants. Their intention is to stop the 1990 celebrations from even occurring and also stop the Commonwealth Games from occurring. How? Oh. Explosives, guns. It's not by peaceful means. The message of fear was further spread via fanciful faxes. It alleges between three and 5,000 predominantly Maoris have been trained recently in revolutionary activity in Moscow, Libya and Cuba. It goes on, photographs have been taken of a fortress in North Auckland known to be holding arms. And there's the claim that photographs have been taken of a submarine delivering arms offshore. It was clear that revolution was just around the corner, or at the very least, just up the creek. Well, I was standing here looking out over here, and like, coming up um, just up the creek there, just um, just slightly above the waterline. They're big, uh, big amphibious crafts, probably Russian. It seemed that our fears were confirmed when activist Sid Jackson took a package tour to Libya, hoping to get some tent time with Muammar Gaddafi. Sadly, the nomadic dictator had moved campsites, and Sid returned without garnering any revolutionary recipes. But he did give Piggy Muldoon the chance to try to frighten us just a little. There is no doubt that there is a radical element in Māoridom today, very small, who say uh, the Māoris have got to take back New Zealand, and if it comes to doing it by the gun, we'll do it. Now, that sounds crazy, but there are some people in Māoridom who are saying that. Uh, a combination of those people and Gaddafi uh, will be dangerous. It won't finally amount to anything, but it's dangerous. Our fear of foreigners wasn't helped by this odd American animation, which screened in Christchurch in the 1960s.
that we humans are characterized by two great fears that other animals are protected from. The fear of life and the fear of death. And that fear of death can make us do strange things. The Greeks stuff vine leaves, the Italians stuff capsicums and the English stuff potatoes. But here in New Zealand, we stuff cats and dogs, and not always for the reasons that you might think. This is the story of a woman who went to extreme measures to save her beloved pet from an untimely demise. I'm glad in a way that I've done it. I know a lot of people think I'm mad, and a lot of them are not very happy about it, but I am. I really am. What makes you happy about it? To know that I've got her. Dolly loved her sash so much that she had the bitch killed and stuffed, even though she was perfectly healthy. Sash was and still is Dolly's best friend. She'd had the healthy dog for more than four years, but when her son bought a Rottweiler, Dolly, having lost a few dogs in the past, couldn't face the possibility the Rotty would end up killing her little dog. I loved her so much and I didn't want her to go on the road, you know, she could have got pulled over, squashed. And then my son came in with his Rottweiler, him and Kushler, and Bim was teasing me, he said to me, Mum, when my dog grows up, I'm gonna, he's gonna eat your dog. And I thought, well, Bim, you're not gonna eat my dog, mate, I'm gonna get her put down, and I'd made my mind up since then. So little Sash was taken to the vet. Pretty sad, when I got up there, the only time I shed the tear was when I knew she was going across, but the lady at the vet did say that you can still change your mind if you want. You know? And I said, no, I've made up my mind to put her down because I'll have her for keeps anyway when I get her back. Her son with the rotty pup was less than impressed. I uh, told her she is a murderer and that she's crazy, man. I mean, somebody said today to you, have you got a husband? That's right, yes. And what did you say to that? I said he died. He's dead. And he said to me, did you stuff him too? And I said, no, I only stuff things I love. But as we'll soon see, fear drives people to undertake all manner of unorthodox undertakings. Some people have a fear of locomotives. Or a fear of peak oil. Some people have a fear of orange. Or even giant loaves of bread. Everywhere in New Zealand, fear is in the air. <coughs> For as long as we've had a broadcast media, they've had us almost perpetually petrified. Generally, we know little about the criminal mind. Society is constantly at risk from the warped and the unhinged, for whom brutality may be only a thought away. The camera never lies, so we believed it when the television cameras of the 1960s revealed a nation victimised by violent crime. Reconstructions brought home the threat. It was black and white. A nightmare in noir. <laughs> Little wonder there were seemingly sane people crowing the cause of corporal punishment. You've got to have something that's short and sharp and leaves an impression. But we've never mongered scares quite like the ones we mongered during the 1980s. Tonight on Faithfully Yours, we're the first of two programmes looking at a problem so horrible to contemplate that many choose to pretend it just doesn't exist. An insidious paranoia took hold in Canterbury and had parents terrified, from a fearful Fairley to a frightened Fendleton. It's not clear whether the problem is greater in Canterbury than elsewhere in New Zealand, but what is known is that the incidence of sexual abuse of children here is at least as bad as anywhere else in the country. Here's Peter Duan. Children. Some people believe that they're our greatest resource. Others label them our greatest victims. This year in Canterbury, hundreds of children will be sexually abused. 
many by their fathers or by other members of their own families. The children will be psychologically scarred for the rest of their lives. Their innocence and their faith and trust in their own family and friends will be shattered. Statistics were to blame. They were the harbinger of horrible mistruths. We were told that up to one in four girls and one in ten boys will be sexually abused by the time they're 16. And although we now know the stats were wrong, the damage was well and truly done. And today, parental paranoia has reached giddy new heights, a condition known as boogeyman anorexia neurosa. Some say we're too protective of our children these days. Others say you can't be too careful. It's hard to believe that we used to let kids walk to school on their own or ride bikes without stack hats. Indeed, life in New Zealand used to be carefree, fun and safe. But then in 1978, a panel of New Zealand's greatest minds revealed how even the humble Kiwi holiday could spell certain death. Good evening, and welcome to the Holiday Survival Test. For the next hour and a half, we're going to subject you to a gruelling quiz. But by the end of it all, you should be able to assess your chances of surviving the holiday season. It was fear-inducing television that would have scared the bejesus out of the Son of God himself. At this range, even a shotgun can blast a hole right through a human body several terrible ways to die. Here's what a direct hit would have done. And a near miss. And question two. A disaster that's becoming all too common. <coughs> These were holidays from hell with barbecue burnings, tragic toddler scolding, <coughs> and death by Austin Cambridge. Terrifying, isn't it? And that's only four gallons of petrol. You'll have double that amount or more in your holiday vehicle. But it was the fear of too little petrol that gripped us the following holiday season when the government's reaction to the oil shock was the introduction of carless days. The rationing rationale was to keep each car off the road for one day a week. But it failed, because Kiwis tend to be careless rather than carless. You know that uh, you're not entitled to drive on an exemption stick? <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'm up on holiday from Wellington. Uh -huh. You've heard all about it, actually. You know what day it is today? Tuesday. Do you know what your carless day sticker says on the front of your car? My God, I've just come to New Zealand. What do you think of the car that stays? All right, it's a waste of time. It doesn't save any petrol. I drive anyway. It hasn't been a carless day yet that I haven't driven. Don't, don't you feel a bit guilty about that when uh, the country's trying to save petrol? Oh, yeah, I suppose so. They had a system where, with carless days, if you felt that you would qualify for an exemption, which would be you have at the X, mm. that if you could supply a good reason, Tick the appropriate box, like you know, working unusual hours, no public transport, those different things. Or at the bottom, it used to say, would said on the form, please specify further further reasons for exemption. Please specify. I wrote two pissed to know what day it is, <laughs> which is was sort of true. You know, I wouldn't have a clue whether it was fucking Wednesday or Tuesday. I wouldn't really know. Luckily, there were no carless days when Dr. Rangi patrolled his practice in 1972. But the popular sitcom dealt with another great fear of the time, sexual dysfunction. Come. Dr. Rangi, the Clydesdales are here to see you. Ah, good. Cinnamon. Mr. Clydesdale, I'm Dr. Rangi. 
Dr. Rangi, my wife is frigid. Frigid? I'm Dr. Rangi. <laughs> no, I mean she won't have sex with me. Well, this is very common. Really? Yes. I don't want to have sex with you, and neither do most people, I'm sure. <laughs> the problem, Doctor, is he can't hoist his mainsail. Mm. Well, there's no point hoisting the mainsail if the port's not open for docking. I can think of one port I'd like to dock at. Ba ba. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Rangi. <laughs> From the dawn of time, there's been one obsession that has troubled every civilization. From the Egyptians, to the Moriori. We've long predicted it, and we've certainly always feared it. It's a monstrous, inconceivable thing, and it can be described in two words. The end. even as a concept, is something far beyond the normal range of human understanding. <laughs> Remarkably, in 1977, the government commissioned this film to help us prepare for the upcoming Armageddon, which would surely arrive well before the year 2000. It was believed that as news of the end of the world spread, law and order would quickly break down. The first victims would naturally be the traffic cops. Fear takes over very easily. Fear of a different Armageddon gripped us in the 1980s and put the PTA on red alert. Marianne, Marianne, what? I'm talking, all right? That's it, you big guys go to the back of the queue. Repugnant, bloody violence ejaculated from the television onto our children's faces, threatening to turn our placid playgrounds into abattoirs of octopus clamps. All this part of his forehead and his head, I'm not sure what happened, but it become rather mushy and sort of um, all soft and uh, as a result, evidently, of this hole being used by one of his friends. It was all thanks to professional wrestling. As proof of its power to influence, New Zealand's first ever recorded playground injury occurred only 15 minutes after the inaugural televising of a local blood fest called On The Mat. And lo, bloodlust was set loose amongst our marmite-mouthed innocents. Do you wrestle yourself? Oh, sorta. <laughs> if the boys are mean. <laughs> when they are wrestling, they don't know where to draw the line. Incapable of telling reality from tellity, our tender tots turned lunchtime into Lord of the Flies. These not so lofty Blomfelds had moves that could well take an eye out, like the coat hanger, the O'Driscoll, and the skidmark inducing flying wedgie. The great wrestling debate's been quiet for a couple of months, but the no matter how amusing the earrings, or Perky the Warning, the underlying message was of horror. Our reporter Kerry Woodham has a headlock on that story. We now had midwitch cuckoos picking themselves to death on the jungle gym or killing their own mothers. He had control over me. Just a bit passed out, you know, there's great big, great big black spots coming at you and couldn't breathe. Mothers who were mysteriously rendered incapable of turning off two appliances at once. You can switch the television off. Yes, I could try and do that, but I doubt very much whether I'd, we've got two TVs in the house. The other one will go back on quick as look at you. Peace studies were inaugurated to help stop the carnage. 
so that we're nicer people, okay. And then there was the principal's favourite, the overly ominous assembly spook talk by somebody who knew the horrors, with after-speech playground mingling that would now surely be banned for other reasons. WrestleMania can safely be convicted of scaremongery from almost any angle. The theme of good, represented here by Mark Lewin, versus the evils of African animists. Muslims. The sheik entering and throwing one giant ball of fire. This, I promise you, will not go unanswered. And homosexuality which was ring rife at the time. There was fear of these testoster hulks ravishing our women with abandon. And the subsequent fear of our women going all lula over other hairier men. Traditionally, women were not supposed to be interested in this type of thing. I love it. What do you like about it? I just love watching it. I'm a good sports girl. The endeavor to get one's opponent prone on has very much in common with uh, uh, inducing a reluctant sexual partner. I think if, um, if the wrestlers were women, possibly I would enjoy the wrestling uh, very much more. Round the throat is driving the voodoo doll in the neck of Mark Lewin. Mark Lewin tied on the ropes. Tied on the ropes and uh, 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 tied on the ropes. Samoa Joe, you the owner. The thing I really loved about On The Mat was uh, Samoan Joe. <laughs> when he saw, yeah, thank you, thank you, Ernie. Uh, I'd uh, like to say a few words in my uh, own language. Yeah, everybody, um, I'm really thankful for supporting me. I'm really, <laughs> I used to laugh. I thought he was going to speak in Samoan. That body slam on the asphalt uh, on Samoan Joe, particularly hard. Yes, it was a particularly hard slam, Barry. I think the closing comments, what a match, what action. As they, as they slam Samoa Joe on the concrete floor outside the ring. Whether it be a fear of fags, a fear of fat, or a fear of foreigners, this cemetery is a reminder of the one fear which unites us all, and this, our Aotearoa, land of fear.